All right. Come on in and have a seat. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Heskett. I am a medical librarian here at UC San Diego, and I am pleased to welcome you all here today for our talk on climate change and its impact on human health. Uh, we hope that this will be the restart of the afternoon talk series here at the Biomedical Library building, so you get to be the first in the restart series, hopefully. We are very excited to have Dr. Bruce Bacar with us today. He is a UC San Diego alumnus who graduated from Ravel College a few years ago, we'll say. Uh, he did that with honors uh, with a BS in biology and pre-med. He then went up the road a little bit to the University of Southern California where he got his medical degree. He is a member of the Doctors for Climate Change with the American Lung Association. And recently, last spring in fact, Dr. Bakar completed the Climate Reality Leadership Training, which is a program developed by former Vice President Al Gore, along with some of our nation's top climate scientists. After a 30-year career in obstetrics and gynecology, and uh, which is up in LA as well as here at Kaiser San Diego. He has left his practice, which will allow him to focus on increasing public awareness about the serious environmental and health risks of climate change. Bruce is a resident of Del Mar and has an impressive track record of service on environmental issues. He was a founding member and chair of the Del Mar Sustainability Advisory Board and currently serves on the city's sea level rise and rise technical advisory committee he is also affiliated with the equinox center which is a nonprofit research and policy center that focuses on innovative and sustainable solutions for a prosperous economy as well as a healthy environment please join me in welcoming bruce back to campus thank you very much Karen, I really appreciate the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here. It really is a thrill to come back to UCSD, particularly to come back and not have to go take a test somewhere. I actually am very pleased to be back in San Diego. I, I, I spent about four days in St. Louis. I don't know if any of you have been to the Midwest lately, but I'll just tell you, you should not go. Um, <laughs> My girlfriend's mom turned 80, and so I had to go on this trip. But I didn't realize this. They actually weigh you on the airplane before they let you leave St. Louis. And if you don't weigh at least 10 pounds more than you did when you landed, they won't let you leave. So a uh, little known fact, it is a law there. Uh, so anyway, I'm really pleased to be able to come here. I loved my time at UCSD. This is like coming home. And this topic has become the most important thing to me. So I'm really pleased to have an audience to be able to share this with. So uh, the first question I think I should ask, I should answer is why I'm here. And the truth is kind of perfect for being here today. Uh, in 2005, a little over 10 years ago, I had come home from a full day's uh, work in my office seeing a lot of patients, and I was going through my mail, and there was a Triton newsletter, a UCSD alumni newsletter. And I must admit I don't always read them cover to cover, but I happened to read it this time, and I looked at an article called the end of the world as we know it. I don't know if any of you saw that article. It was about research being done at, at SIO about climate change. It was the first thing I'd ever read about climate change. It completely changed my life. I went out and got rid of my BMW. I got a Prius. I did a green remodel of my home. I joined the Sustainability Advisory Board. Uh, I got solar panels. I eventually got an electric car, and I kept thinking over the next few years that the whole world was going to wake up to this problem because of how serious it was, that everything about the world that I cherished was at risk with this issue. And I'm sure you realize, as I did, that not enough has happened about responding to climate change in the last 10 years, particularly in the U.S. So a couple of years ago, I did leave my practice because, as I would put it as a graduate here from here in biology and as a practicing doc for a long time, uh, essentially what I'd say is Mother Nature's in the ICU. And not nearly enough is being done to get her out of it. And I do believe, again, from my background in biology, my understanding of natural systems, that if nature goes, so do we. So with that cheerful introduction, Let's talk. We're going to break this down into three sections. The first section is going to be about the fact that climate change is no longer just a concept. It's already happening. So we'll talk about that and kind of have an overview. The second part of this will be about the human health impacts. 
And thirdly, we'll talk about, if anybody can stand it, we'll talk about some good news, some things that are going on in the world that are actually positive and ways that you can participate. And I'll stick around a little bit for questions. So I'm just going to jump into this. Any kind of a conversation about climate change has to start with an understanding of what the atmosphere is. And I know I'm talking to an extremely educated crowd here, but one of the things I learned that shocked me, uh, these, most of these slides are from Al Gore's climate reality training, is how thin the atmosphere is. So if, you, if the Earth was represented by a globe and it was sitting over on that podium over there, the thickness of the atmosphere that we depend upon to regulate temperature and provide us oxygen to breathe, the thickness of the atmosphere is equivalent to about a layer of varnish over that globe. That's how incredibly thin the atmosphere is. Less than one-tenth of a percent of the diameter of the Earth is our atmosphere. And what we do to it that's pertinent to today is we fill it full of gases. Some of these are called greenhouse gases because they intensify the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is actually a good thing. That's what causes temperatures to be regulated and the Earth's atmosphere to be warm enough for us to survive. But too much of a good thing, as always, can be bad. So we plow all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and the impact of that, according to science, can be summed up that way. The amount of heat trapped by greenhouse gases every day in our atmosphere is equivalent to 400,000 explosions of nuclear bombs every single day, every day of the year. 400,000 nuclear bombs worth of heat. And what's that, what that has done is it's caused temperatures to shift around the world. This is back when things were more or less normal back in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up. There were an equal number of cooler than average days and warmer than average days. And what's happened, and this is just the first decade of this century, it's actually gotten even more exaggerated now, we still have cooler than average days and average days, but there are far fewer of them percentage-wise. We have a preponderance or an overabundance of warmer than average days, and this whole new category called extremely hot days, which didn't even show up on the bell curve because they were so infrequent before. They've increased a hundredfold, and you've been hearing about these on the news all the time. These are the extremely hot days. And now, 10% of the time we have temperatures like that. And in case you've heard some distortions of the data, there has been a steady warming of the planet ever since the 1980s, decade by decade. Temperatures have continued to go up around the world. You probably heard on the news just recently that 2015 was the warmest year ever recorded on the planet, not by a small amount, by actually quite a bit. And so first we're going to talk about the impact of these increased temperatures on weather. There is this phenomenon called the hydrological cycle, and it's not going to be on the test, so you don't need to memorize any of this stuff. But essentially it's the flow of water around the planet, from the land and the sea up into the atmosphere and then back down onto the, to the ground again. And this is intensified greatly by that extra heat in the atmosphere. It sort of makes this, uh, it amplifies or intensifies the hydrological cycle, and it creates what they called at the training, weather on steroids. So in his soft-spoken way, Al Gore says, so the downpours get bigger. This is not a photograph from a Hollywood special effects movie. This is a downpour in Montana. What happens is with a warmer atmosphere, it can hold a lot more water. The way that you know this is if you're in the bathroom and you turn on the hot shower, you close the door in the bathroom, pretty soon the mirror fogs up, right? The reason it does is because the atmosphere in the bathroom with the closed door heats up from the, the heat in the shower. That puts a lot more water into the atmosphere inside the bathroom, and it condenses on the shower mirror. So warmer atmospheres hold a lot more water. So what happens when that water starts to come out, uh, starts to fall as rain? Well, you've got a lot more water up there. So oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes you get downpours that are crazy. How many of you noticed and were kind of surprised by the amount of rain we were getting, the intensity of the rain we were getting earlier this month? That was pretty impressive, right? And it actually did a fair amount of damage, and it's doing damage up and down the coast. We hear a lot more about it in other parts of the world. This is a little bit of cell phone video a couple of years ago in Washington. Rain was coming down so hard, it was coming in sideways.
This is the following day. And I actually wish that the people that worked in that building over there, also known as the Capitol Building, would have looked out the window that day and decided to do something about this. But too many of them were busy saying it didn't happen. But downpours are not just limited to the US. This is 10 inches of rain in three hours in France, 13 inches of rain in one day in India, Argentina, Pakistan. I have so many of these slides, I have to just include the best ones. Texas had a drought like ours until last summer. It was all over in one weekend. There's a river called the Blanco in east central Texas that was at five feet level at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night when the rain started to fall. By one in the morning, three hours later, the Blanco had gone from five feet past its previous record of 33 to 40 feet in three hours. It's the kind of rain you get when there's a lot more water in the atmosphere. I just include this slide for irony. I'm pretty sure the city planners in Grafton didn't anticipate if they called it Water Street that everybody would be boating on it one day. Now, 90% of the extra heat in the atmosphere, we talked about how much heat there was, or at least I showed you one way to look at it, 90% of that heat has gone into the ocean so far. And that's, that heat and the CO2 are bad for the oceans on a number of levels. But one of the ways that we're looking at it, the way that we're talking about it right now, is its impact on weather. Warmer waters increase the intensity of tropical storms. So storms get stronger when they encounter warmer water. It is no coincidence that Typhoon Haiyan channeled itself right over the path of warmest water in the, in, in the Indian Ocean. And then when it reached the Philippines, basically just leveled them. Again, the storm got stronger and stronger as it encountered unusually warm water. It takes the power from that. Hurricane Sandy became Superstorm Sandy because it went up the East Coast at a time when the water on the East Coast was up to nine degrees warmer than normal. So it got all that extra strength from the, the heat in the water, and everybody knows what happened to Manhattan and New Jersey. And in case you think we're dodging this bullet, this is three months ago. Does anybody recognize this picture? It was called Hurricane Patricia. It was a Category 5 storm right off the coast of Mexico. Sustained winds of 200 miles an hour. This was a hugely powerful storm. The only reason it didn't level a huge part of Mexico was we got incredibly lucky. That storm came ashore where it did. It was 130 miles north of Puerto Vallarta. It, it went in where there basically weren't any people, and it ran right into a mountain range and dissipated. Otherwise, this would have been as devastating as Katrina or Sandy or any of the others. So we got really lucky. But it did little things like pushing little boats up against the, the rocks. It's an oil tanker that people had to be airlifted off of. Now, the increased warming in the ocean also melts sea ice. No surprise. This is 1984, same spot, same time of year, 2012 glaciers, land ice, melting as well. 1978 in Peru, same exact spot, 2004. These are massive differences. So the combination of melting of land ice and sea ice and increased temperature, thermal expansion in the oceans causes something called sea level rise. This is something, if you haven't been thinking about it, you probably have been hearing about it. You're going to hear a lot more about it now. Back in 2009 in the Maldives, they were trying to make a point, and so they made sort of a publicity stunt of a council meeting underwater. They may be having to do this out of necessity before long. This little island country, I believe it's in the Indian Ocean, has actually had to go to the, uh, to the extent of buying land elsewhere to be able to move its citizens because its land is literally disappearing because of sea level rise. And this is another profound impact of sea level rise that doesn't get talked about much. Uh, salt infiltration from seawater into fertile farmland destroys that land as farmland. So even if the ocean doesn't overtake the land, if it just gets into the aquifers and goes up through the ground, uh, it poisons farmland. So especially in parts of the world, that, as it turns out, thinking of where the warmest water is in the equ equatorial region, there are a lot of poor areas around the equator around the world where they can't really afford to lose farmland, this is now a major cause of concern. And by the way, coming back home, this is Miami on a high tide. 
It's not a storm, it's just high tide. Worldwide, there's been about three, three inches of sea level rise so far. The east coast around Florida, about eight inches. But whenever you hear these numbers, you have to understand that these are scientists giving you these numbers. And unfortunately, scientists are not very trained as communicators. They're talking about a vertical measurement. So eight inches vertically, or a foot, as is predicted for San Diego by 2050, and that's probably a conservative measurement, a foot of sea level rise measured vertically is between 50 and 100 feet run up on the beach. So if you want a sense of that, go to your favorite beach, particularly if it's a flat one like Coronado or La Jolla Shores or Del Mar, Imperial Beach, and find out where the mean high tide line is, where the kelp is up on the sand, and walk 50 to 100 steps inland and see how many streets you're going by. See how much real estate is, is going to disappear. One and a half billion dollars in real estate is already in the floodplain. I don't even want to begin to imagine how many billions of dollars we're talking about if we get a, f a foot of sea level rise, and it could be a lot more than that. But just remember now, every time you hear somebody talk about how much sea level rise, they're talking about vertical measurement, and you've got to think the run-up, and the run-up is 50 to 100 times more. So this is a profound risk. Changing gears a little bit, the other side of this, if we're talking about atmospheres that hold a lot more water and so can create these downpours that are super intense, the other side of that is it takes longer for the atmosphere to fill up. It can hold a lot more water, so you get a longer interval between rainfall, and that's known as drought. Everybody follow that? Again, if the atmosphere holds more water, it takes longer before that water falls. I don't know how many times last winter I looked up at the sky and it looked like it was going to pour. And it just seemed to go on for hours and hours and hours. The sky was so pregnant with rain. It was just still filling up. It takes longer for that rain to come out. When it comes out, it can come out with incredible volume and force. But there's longer intervals between rainfall with this kind of heated atmosphere. And so you get drought. This is farmland that was ruined by drought in the Middle East. And of course, everybody's very familiar with drought in California. And you may not know this, but the reason we're getting rain this year is because they literally ran out of adjectives to describe how bad our drought was. It went from severe to extreme, and it, then it got worse, so they had to name it something else. They called it exceptional, which I thought was kind of lousy, because don't you all want to be exceptional? <laughs> so they didn't have anything else to call it, so we got an El Nino and it's raining. This is last year in March, the height of the ski season. It's a really bad time to be a ski area operator up until this winter. And this is Sequoia National Park last year. It was at a 500-year low. It was at 5% of the normal snowfall. There were times when they sent out, the state of California sent out the people that measure the snowpack, and they just turned around and came back home. They called them back because there was nothing to measure. This is a huge point financially. I don't really want to talk about economics, but we should keep in mind the fact that there are jobs lost and people that suffer as a result of, of uh, prolonged droughts, particularly since more drought is predicted. But the other side of this that's very important, and we're starting to approach the topic of human health, is with drought and warmer temperatures, you get more fires. This is a photo of the Rim Fire in Yosemite. The Rim Fire was a massive fire. I believe it was in 2014, in summertime. It used to be that large fires in California burned for about a week. This was not contained for a full nine weeks. It cost $127 million to put out the Rim Fire, and it burned over a quarter of a million acres. This was a massive fire. And the reason you haven't been hearing about it over and over and over is because there have been so many other large fires all around the world because, again, of climate change. The Rim Fire was so big, satellites could photograph it. Do you all see it here? That's a fire you saw from space. Again, prior to the year 2000, about 500 houses were lost to fires per year in California. Since 
2001, it's been more like 1,000 on average. Just last September, there were 2,000 homes that were ruined in one month. Western Australia, I'm sure you've heard, has been having horrendous problems with large-scale fires. And Russia had a really toxic combination of a severe heat wave five years ago in summertime and fires. And 55,000 people died during those several weeks when those two things were going on. They died of smoke inhalation. They died of carbon monoxide. They died from the fires themselves. So let's talk about health impacts. I, I'm just going to gloss over this very briefly. I just ran across these statistics from the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication. And it's just interesting that slightly more than half of people, when surveyed, not only didn't believe that they would be harmed personally by global warming, they also denied that anybody was really being affected by it, prevailing opinions. Well, let's talk about direct impacts. These are things that happen to people, deaths or injuries at the time of the event, immediate consequences. The California heat wave, 650 people in 2006. I remember that heat wave. Hurricane Katrina, this was, of course, a massive storm, but it was also one that hit a developed country that they saw coming for days, and still nearly 2,000 people died. Typhoon Haiyan, we saw a photograph from the Philippines, over 6,000 deaths. The European heat wave in 2003 killed over 70,000 people. When you have more of these events, fires and heat waves and major tropical storms, you get direct, immediate impacts. This is a illustration of that time around, uh, excuse me, it was 2010 uh, when Moscow was having, and the areas around Western Russia were having these massive fires and this heat wave. But what you're seeing, the red dots are carbon monoxide levels that are increased. And what's interesting about it is that the carbon monoxide levels are elevated way past the boundaries of the fire because fires create a lot of carbon monoxide, and that carbon monoxide is carried in the atmosphere to other places that are essentially downwind. Carbon monoxide in small amounts, it's an odorless, colorless gas, so you never know if it's around, but in small amounts it causes maybe some fatigue or headaches or something like that. But in high concentration, carbon monoxide causes seizures or it can kill you, one or the other, maybe both. Fine particulates are in the area of two and a half microns or less. They're essentially invisible to the naked eye, but those are also carried by fires and go way beyond the perimeter of the fire. If you have pre-existing uh, heart or lung disease and you are in an area with a high concentration of these fine particulates, you're very likely going to end up having an uh, exaggeration of your symptoms and maybe even end up in the hospital with them. They can lead to uh, heart attacks and other rather serious consequences. And there are toxic chemicals certainly released by fires. Now Scripps, in interestingly enough to me, doesn't just investigate oceanography. They also studied fire behavior and gave us some uh, statistics about changes in Southern California's fire behavior with the temperature increase prior to 2013, which was less than one degree Celsius or about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And that always sounds like it's not very much, right? When somebody says, oh, it'll be a degree warmer, and most people kind of yawn and nod their heads and you know, go on to the next thing. But just to show you how sensitive systems are that, for instance, govern the kinds of fires that we have, the incidence of fires with this one and a half degree increase in global temperatures on Southern California fires, the incidence of fires, they tripled during this time period. The amount of area burned increased by six times and we've all noticed this, the fire season lengthened. It lengthened by 78 days. This is all due to what's predicted to be less than half of the livable amount of climate change that we can tolerate. It's had a massive increase on our Southern California fires. So flooding, aside from causing immediate deaths and injuries, you can imagine from those photos that I showed, infectious diseases like these that are shown, viral illnesses, uh, vector-borne, viral illnesses, uh, bacterial illnesses, protozoan, toxic substances are released, and we'll talk a little bit about mental health effects. Heat waves are something that we encounter a lot in Southern California now and in San Diego. And there's a spectrum everywhere from just mild heat cramps all the way up to heat, heat stroke, which does, in fact, cause a lot of loss of life. 
This guy was photographed in the number one state in the country for heat-related deaths. Does anybody want to venture a guess? I can tell you it's not California, but it's one of our neighbors. There you go. Think of why they come here every summer. So heat-related deaths actually cause more deaths than any other weather-related cause, all of them combined. But the really scary thing is the mega heat waves, those that are especially extreme and severe and predicted to, uh, and actually last longer than other heat waves, they're predicted to increase five to tenfold in the next 40 years. So just think, maybe there's 10 days out of the summer that are just really unpleasantly hot and those heat waves seem to drag on. If you can imagine five to 10 times more, 50 to 100 days out of the year are what are predicted in the next 40 years that will be part of a mega heat wave. That's almost a third of the year, almost one day in three. That's a really sobering idea. At least 2,000 people during one heat wave. And this number is amazing. Heat index is a combination of heat and humidity. 165 degrees in one day in the Middle East. It's, again, sort of mind-boggling. Remember also, more water in the atmosphere means this heat is more humid. That's what heat indexes are all about. And one of the things that the body does, its primary um, effort to try to cool itself off is to sweat. And sweating doesn't work very well in a humid environment. You may sweat all you want, but it doesn't give you the kind of relief that it normally does if you're in humidity. Now, you don't need even a severe heat wave to impact human health. The sort of the poster child for this next concept, which is air pollution or ozone in particular, is Beijing. Most people have heard about China having kind of a bit of a problem with air pollution. So this is a photograph taken on, I don't even know how they found a clear day, but they did find a clear day in Beijing. This is the, the same photograph on a different day. This is caused in large part by heat. Heat increases concentration of ozone. And ozone, again, increases with temperature. It impairs lung function. It increases asthma and heart attacks and leads to an increase in hospitalizations and deaths. So ozone is not benign. And ozone increases with temperature. In addition to that, pollens increase with temperature. So if you're one of the 55 million people in the U.S. that has a sensitivity to one of the common airborne pollens, you have a worse time with warmer weather, with heat waves, with increased temperatures. Also, the season is prolonged. And not everybody tolerates these things as well as everybody else. Certain groups in the population are particularly sensitive, the very, very young, the elderly, uh, people that are poor, socially isolated, uh, those that are chronically unwell or obese tend to have a more difficult time, and people with mental health problems. And speaking about mental health impacts, it's not hard to imagine that someone that has a pre-existing mental issue would have a particularly hard time dealing with extreme weather. But I think you or I, virtually anybody who encounters the sort of extreme weather that destroys their livelihood or takes away members of their family or their close friends, or has their entire neighborhood destroyed, I can imagine any one of us could have PTSD after that or certainly anxiety or depression for some length of time. So we're all in this category as potentially at risk. Now, certain life forms really dig these conditions, as it turns out. Not everybody's having a rough time. When I went to medical school at USC, we spent, I think, two hours on tropical diseases because we were told, you're never going to see these. They don't come to the U.S. They don't come to the continental U.S. So if you ever move to the tropics, you can study them there. Well, not true anymore. All of these illnesses have been diagnosed in the U.S. The big one for us is West Nile virus in California, and those numbers are doubling every year or even more. Last year, I think in 2014, there were 12 deaths from West Nile. Last year, there were 45. Five of those deaths were in San Diego County. West Nile is something significant. It's an it's a, um, illness carried by mosquitoes. So what happens, a lot of these illnesses, again, we're 
confined to the tropics, but essentially the tropics has enlarged to the north and to the south due to the increase in temperature, and so these organisms can now survive happily in a bigger area. All these ones that are mentioned, uh, dengue fever and Chagas disease, Lyme disease, protozoan, viral, bacterial, uh, valley fever, coxie, which is a fungal illness that affects the lungs, loves drought, so it's been particularly happy in California lately. And contaminated food or water that you get with flooding can cause all of these uh, viral and bacterial illnesses that uh, particularly affect children. This one you might have heard about. It's been on the news lately. Has anybody heard about Zika virus? It's been on the news. This is kind of a big deal because this virus, although it causes either no symptoms or mild symptoms in most adults, if you're pregnant in the first three months, what we call the first trimester, and you come into contact with a Zika virus, it very likely will affect your newborn either to kill it or to have it be born with severe microcephaly, which basically means a shrunken head, a shrunken brain. There's no treatment for that. And countries around the world now are issuing travel declarations to, say, to tell people to avoid traveling to the parts of the world where the Zika virus is showing up. It's proliferating like mad. It's another mosquito-borne viral illness that really likes these conditions. Or where it used to be confined to certain parts of Africa and Asia, very, very narrow range equatorially, it's now being found to the north and to the south of that in Central America and South America and in other places in Asia. I don't have them off the top of my head, but there's been a, a big problem with this. And I even wonder about, I mean, they're telling women in Colombia, the public health department is telling them not to get pregnant right now until they get this all figured out. This is a huge risk to pregnant women. And it's another virus, according to um, Bill McKibben of 350.org, he says this is an example of, of epi epidemiologic and economic apartheid, essentially meaning poorer countries that are now getting invaded by this virus are going to have a much harder time with it than developing countries will. So you'll be hearing more about this. We need food and water to combat illness, to maintain our health. And these are also under stress. So this is part of the whole equation about health impacts of climate change. Drought and water shortages are a serious problem. San Diego's water needs are projected to increase 46% by 2050. Uh, but in addition to that, talking about organisms that don't deal well with climate change, plants do much more poorly than we do. They don't adapt nearly as well. And so we're seeing increased uh, crop losses like never before due to uh, due to drought, due to extreme weather, due to weather that's just out of, out of season. When we were in Iowa for this climate reality training, we had farmers and farm scientists come up and talk to us, and, and they basically made the point that if you get rain uh, or snow just a couple of weeks out of sync with normal patterns, it can, can destroy their crop for a good six months or a year. So these crops are very sensitive. In addition, the pests that like to eat these crops seem to like these conditions quite a bit. And so the pests are proliferating and having a field day and the crops are dying. Southern California, by the way, makes up a large percentage of the amount of food that we eat in this country. And so our droughts had a big impact on that. And this fellow was a farmer in Syria who lost his cropland. There are those who think that a, a good part of the destabilization of Syria had to do with the drought and people flooding the cities and food shortages. So this is not a benign condition where you just go a little bit hungry. And we're going to see a couple of statements from scientists. And scientists, I, I, probably a lot of you have advanced degrees or are on your way to getting one. Y you know when you talk to scientists, they don't like to make declarative, dramatic statements. They're kind of the polar opposite of the guys on, the, on cable news <laughs> or on talk radio who will make a dramatic statement about anything to get ratings. These guys don't like to come out with stuff like this. But they're pretty dismayed. And this fellow is the co-chair of the Lancet Commission on Health and Climate Change. The Lancet is in the top two or three medical journals for the last 150 years in the world. So they're extremely cautious and conservative and measured in their public statements. And what they're saying in their report is that climate change will likely undo all of the public health benefits that we've seen, all the advances that we've made in health in the last 40 years will likely disappear 
as a result of climate change. And just because animals don't have a voice, we have to remember they're being severely impacted by what's going on. And in addition to this statistic, more than half of all the animals on the earth have died in the last 40 years. Let that sink in. We talked about some of the ocean impacts, how the ocean is absorbing heat. It's also absorbing CO2. CO2 combining with H2O gives you carbonic acid. The oceans are acidified. And everything that has a shell, from zooplankton all the way up to shellfish and oysters, coral reefs, everything that has an exoskeleton, can't form a normal exoskeleton with acidification. So the food chain in the ocean is dying, and those animals are dying. This is a professor of integrative biology at UC Berkeley. I don't like the term extinction spasm. It just doesn't sound good. The Pope said it. He wasn't subtle. Bless his heart. And Al showed us this slide. He says, I don't know, but it kind of seems like God's trying to get our attention. This is methane gas exploding through the surface of the earth in what was previously called permafrost. But you can't call it permafrost anymore if it thaws. And in Siberia, the permafrost has been thawing. And so these trapped collections of methane are literally blowing up through the ground. Methane is something like 20 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas, so it's not good that way. And here the earth opened up and swallowed a car just to try to get people's attention. And I think it's probably not accidental that it happened to swallow a gas-guzzling Escalade. <laughs> Notice that wasn't a Prius or, God forbid, a Leaf or a Tesla. I think Mother Nature has a sense of humor, but I don't think she's in a very good mood. So what's at risk? Flooding like we've never seen before, tropical storms of an intensity that we haven't seen that are happening over and over, droughts of historic proportions, Increased intensity of fires, lengthening of fire seasons, shortage of food, shortage of water, political destabilization, climate refugees. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that this is our way of life. And just because people aren't talking about it every day, it doesn't mean it's not true. Now, if you can stand it, let's talk about some good things that are going on. Is everybody still breathing <laughs> for the moment? Barely. Barely. <laughs> Well, there's some good news, and it has to do with alternative energy. So let's talk about wind first. It was projected in 2000 that within a decade, we'd reach 30 gigawatts of electricity produced by wind around the world. A gigawatt is a billion watts. That's a lot. The reality is, a few years later, we were at 360 billion watts of wind capacity. That, in large part, is due to the drop in cost of wind, And global wind energy capacity followed. And of course, in an opposite way, I have uh, probably two dozen slides of wind power being used all over the world. I just got a representative sample. That was Kenya. This is China. Mexico's been aggressive about deploying wind power. And at the end of 2014, we were making enough power in the US from wind to power all of the homes in California. So that's a lot. But if that story, and again, I'm, I'm going through this quickly, if that story sounds pretty impressive, solar is an even more amazing story. It was predicted in 2002 that eight years later we'd be at a billion watts per year by 2010. By the time we got to 2010, it was 17 billion watts. It was seven time, 17 times more than was predicted. Four years later, a couple of years ago, it was 48 billion watts per year of increased solar capacity. Last year, they were predicting 62 times. So solar is going crazy. Same kind of story. When, how many of you are old enough to remember when Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House? That was a long time ago. He paid something like $27 a watt. Uh, it's dropped more than 90% since the year 2000. You can see how fast costs have come down. And it's important to remember that we talk about trying to find a new source of energy there's a fusion reactor that shows up in the sky every single day of the year and stays there all day long. It never takes a day off. And it produces enough energy 
in an hour to meet the needs of the entire world for a year. So talk about untapped capacity. This is the potential of solar. Photovoltaic solar panel installations have gone up exponentially, and solar is all over the world. Australia has gotten the message. It's more than one in seven houses in Australia. This is a town I've never heard of somewhere in Bolivia, but solar power across Latin America nearly quadrupled in 2014, was supposed to triple last year. This is really interesting. As cost of power has come down, as panels have become less expensive, uh, people that have been shut out and have had no electricity at all are now being able to buy what, what they call pay-as-you-go solar, where they don't even have to pay the greatly reduced price of these solar panels. They can just pay how much for how much they're using of that. And you have to remember that if you're in a village where there's no electricity at all, that this is truly a transformative thing. A single solar panel changes your entire life. The number one place for solar installations, residential solar installations in the world, is Bangladesh, where two per minute are installed. And a lot of times, it's just a single solar panel stuck on the roof of your, of your home with wires run through the roof. And all of a sudden, you have electricity. You've joined the world. You can charge your cell phone which connects you to the world. You, can, you have a source of light that's not toxic. This is a transformative technology. Al says he always thought he looked pretty cool when he had a cell phone back when they were first coming out. I don't know if any of you remember cell phones, but they were, I mean, these literally were, were something you could use to defend yourself. They weighed a lot. You could hit people with them. They had to be carried in a briefcase. But the predictions about cell phones very much like what we've seen with alternative energy. Predictions with cell phones were, I think in 1992, it was predicted, AT&T commissioned a study, that by the year 2000, eight years later, there would be 900 million cell phones in use. Of course, by the time we got to the year 2000, it was in the tens of billions. They were way off. It's a similar story. Price came down, technology improved. And the government didn't have to get involved with you getting a cell phone. You could do it yourself. You can get wind power or solar pan uh, power yourself. This is a kind of a fun story in Africa. Apparently, in certain parts of Africa, if you're lucky enough to have electricity in your neighborhood, they don't have enough people to really troubleshoot it. So if you have a problem in your house, they don't go and troubleshoot where the problem is and find the short. They just string up another line. So after a few years in your neighborhood, your utility pole looks like a rat's nest and probably does have rats in it. This is a big job creator, as we'll talk about. This slide last year used to say that solar jobs now outnumber coal jobs in the US. Coal jobs about 80,000 or so. But now, as of 2015, uh, solar industry jobs are over 200,000. Oil and gas extraction jobs in the US about 180,000. But I like to also remind people that if you're working in coal, then there's not a small chance you'll end up with black lung disease and dying by the, by the time you're 60. The worst thing that happens to these guys in the solar power industry is maybe they get a sunburn if they're not careful. There's a big difference to working in those industries. And the financial world is starting to, to take note about the impact of alternative energy. And these are not sentimental assessments. This is pure dollars and cents. By the end of this year, it's predicted that in 47 out of 50 states in this country, it's no more expensive to get your electricity from solar panels on your roof than to buy it from your utility. That's parity. And that's without government incentives. Tesla figured this out. They seem to, Elon Musk seems to figure out a lot of stuff. Uh, when they announced a scalable battery solution for solar energy. In the first week after their announcement, they had over 38,000 orders. They sold out their production through halfway through this year in the first week. This removes the last remaining problem with solar panels, which is you know what people complain about, which is the sun doesn't shine at night. Well, thank you very much. I think most people realize the sun doesn't shine at night. But if you have a business that only runs at night, like a restaurant or something like that, that opens at 5 p.m. and you have panels on the roof of your restaurant, you can collect energy all day long, put it in your batteries, and then you have plenty of good, clean, non-fossil fuel energy to use all night long. So this is what solar's been waiting for. And the, predict the predictions for how big an industry batteries will be are in the tens of billions of dollars pretty fast. Now, this is something we can show anybody in California. 
to be proud of. That there was a bill passed last fall that 50 percent of our electricity will come from renewables by 2030, thanks to Jerry Brown. But in San Diego, we can be even more proud, because how many of you are aware we passed in the city of San Diego a climate action plan? Did anybody hear about that in December? 100 percent renewables by 2035. We make these state people look like pikers. I'm very proud of that passage of that climate action plan, and, and we are totally committed to making it verifiable and to making it actually happen. A uh, little bit more polling data. Millennials, uh, a lot of students at UCSD want the U.S. to move to renewables. They get it. Whatever yik yak is, uh, I presume people under 25 know about it. 70 percent are concerned, particularly uh, because of the strange winter weather we've been having. China's off the sidelines and is finally playing along. And a lot of businesses are realizing that not only is solar equivalent in cost, in many instances it may be cheaper, and there are a lot fewer hoops that you need to jump through if you're using solar or alternative energy compared to the increasing amount of regulation and restriction on fossil fuels. And then there's a whole other phenomenon called divestment. This is the rotation of money out of traditional investments into alternative energy investments. This is money coming out of oil and coal and gas and going into wind and solar. And it's not a trifling amount. In 2014, it was, it was uh, a tally to be $50 billion of investments was coming out of uh, large institutions, large foundations and municipalities and universities and being rotated into clean energy stocks. By last year, it went from $50 billion to $2.7 trillion more than a 50-fold increase in one year, the money rolling out of dirty energy into clean energy. And this, by the way, is a huge thing politically because share price has everything to do with future earnings. And have you noticed what's been happening to the price of oil lately? It keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. That's political clout. Their share price, their earnings give them people to listen to in Washington, D.C. I have a feeling that they're not going to get as much reception as the industries where this money is pouring into right now. This will have a big impact on regulation. It used to be that renewables struggled against fossil fuels in terms of investment in new energy generating capacity, but you can see year by year it's really starting to dwarf fossil fuels. A couple of my favorite slides and then we're going to get close to wrapping up here. This is heaven sent electricity at the Vatican. I just love that slide. These are kids in a part of Africa that's always been cut off from the world, but with inexpensive laptops and a portable, lightweight, durable solar panel, they're part of the rest of us now. They've joined the world. I just love that slide. And also in 2014, that was the first year since 1985 when global CO2 had not continued to go up without a global economic collapse. The only two years between 85 and 2014 where, where CO2 did not rise were 1999 and 2008 when there were sort of some fiscal kerfuffles going on in the world. But in 2014, emissions did not go up and the economy was strong. So this sets the stage for us to turn down emissions. Very quickly, what do you do? You live in San Diego. It should be clear to you that we are where climate change is happening. It's happening now already. We have to be aware that our fire season has gotten longer and more intense, so be prepared for fires. As far as heat waves, don't go looking for a fan during a heat wave. Have you ever tried to do that? They laugh at you when you walk in the store to try to buy a fan during a heat wave. Make sure you have good hydration and adequate ventilation in your home and know the signs of heat stroke, particularly if you have people around you who are in one of those vulnerable categories. So if somebody has particularly red skin and a rapid pulse and shallow breathing and a mental status change where they no longer make any sense when they're talking, it's either Donald Trump or <laughs> they have heat stroke and they need an emergency room. They do not need a margarita. Uh, flooding is still a risk. Our El Nino is not over with. We'll probably see more of that in the next couple of months. So be prepared and don't go swimming through flood water. And as far as infectious disease, I think the main thing we need to be worried about in San Diego is West Nile. And so you shouldn't have standing water around your house outside and uh, you should have insect repellent. It's easy to participate in this. Everybody can do these things because it saves money. Eat less meat. Does anyone have a guess about how many gallons of water it takes to make one pound of edible beef? What's a lot of water? Just a guess. How many is a lot? 
How many? 1,100 gallons for one pound of edible beef. It's more. Who's got a, who's got a guess? <laughs> Just give me a number. 25. Okay, it's a good guess, but you're, you're a little too high. It's 1,800 gallons. <laughs> so when you look at two half-pound hamburgers, that's 1,800 gallons of water. You were, you were on the right track, definitely. So eating less red meat helps. Save water, we know about that. Burning less gas and propane, I'd like to tell fellow surfers, don't just sit there at the beach with your motor running. Don't pull over to the side of the road with your car running and text for 30 minutes, if you can help it. Change your light bulbs out for LEDs. They've gotten a lot cheaper. The next thing you can do is to look into getting solar power at your house. And when you're thinking about getting an electric car, remember, you're not paying, you're not paying gasoline every month. So whatever an electric car might cost you, you're probably saving three quarters of what you've been paying for fuel. I have an electric car, which cost me about $5 a month in electricity. It may cost as much as $20 a month in electricity, but the average person spends $150 to $200 on gas. So that eliminates that cost. And I would not look at a candidate who doesn't admit that this is a problem that needs to be dealt with now urgently. You can take your millions of dollars that you have in your retirement portfolios, all of you, and rotate them out of fossil fuels. It's not only the right thing to do, it's probably far better investment advice and join groups committed to solving the climate crisis. In San Diego, to me, those are 350.org. They have a San Diego office. There's something called the Climate Action Campaign. These are a, a group of ladies downtown who are very well politically connected. Uh, Nicole Capretz heads up the Climate Action Campaign. She basically wrote the San Diego's Climate Action Plan. She's really dynamic and really well connected, so I'm giving her lots of my support. The Climate Reality Project, where I got a lot of my slides and got trained, is free and open to anybody. They do three-day trainings. They do three of them a year. I can tell you more about it if you want to come up and talk to me. I had, a, I had a great time with them. I have a Facebook page called Del Mar Can for Climate Action Now, and Dolores is on it, kindly enough. Um, it's just a place for people to connect and get information and inspiration. I'd love to have you. And then this is the Climate Reality Project, which you can find online. As I say, the training is free. And I'll just say in closing, because I know I've probably gone on for too long, that I really think that we have not just a moral obligation, but a biological imperative to stop climate change. And I will tell you that I have cards at the back desk, and I have some up here. Uh, I would love to come and speak at your groups and for your organizations and any particular individuals you think really need to hear this message. I'm available all the time. I am committed to this. And I'm here because of what's at risk. I go for a walk on the bluffs near there in Del Mar every day in the morning and at night. And I would be really sad to see this part of the coast ruined and all the other impacts that we're talking about. So I would just ask that you give real serious thought to becoming more a part of the solution than you were coming in here today because I think this is going to get decided in the next few years and we all need to be involved, not just hoping it gets a little better or thinking about it on occasion. This is a fight for our lives. Thank you. Now, if you can stick around a little bit, I'm happy to try to answer your questions, but we do have microphones, I think, because they're videotaping this. So if you just raise your hand if you have a question. I'll get you a mic. Gentleman right in the back. How about population increase? It seems to be a variable that can wash out all these others. I don't know relative numbers in terms of impact, but I certainly agree with you that population is a problem that needs to be solved as well because that puts a big burden on resources. I think both of them need to be paid attention to. I see this one as potentially being uh, more catastrophic uh, sooner than population, but uh, I'm concerned about population as well. Does anybody else have a <laughs> yeah, uh, sort of given the urgency, as you said, of, of this timeline, I mean, I think so most of us who came here today are probably believe in climate change or at least are trusting of the methodologies that scientists yeah. use to develop theories about climate change and its impacts. Um, since about half of this country um, has sort of what seems to be a deep mistrust of those fundamental tools, um, and therefore, you know, a, a talk like this, which I think is fantastic, is less likely to move them or even cause them to 
retreat from to a more staunch position. Any thoughts on how this effort to change hearts and minds, which I think is going to be crucial to getting meaningful climate action in this country in the next few years, certainly, uh, how, how that can actually be accomplished? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and it's something I've wondered about many, many times, and I don't know the answer. I don't know that anybody has the answer. I know, like the Yale Project on Climate Change Communications, looking into what, what affects people, what motivates people, and there are a lot of other great efforts. There's one out of USD that's been, um, University of San Diego, that's been uh, also very active with this. Two things come to mind immediately. First of all, I don't, we don't need to convince everybody to get things done. I also think about how common it is now for people to bring their shopping bags into the market, where 10 or 15 years ago, almost nobody did that. But now, every time I walk into the store, if I forgot my bag, I feel almost naked. It's a really uncomfortable feeling. And how rapidly that's become the norm. So I think it's a mistake to look at people's views and consider them to be really uh, immovable. I think they are more flexible than we can tell by looking at them, even listening to them. I think some people will never change their mind, but we don't need to have everybody get on the bus. We just need to get the bus moving. So I don't know what else there is to do except to just keep on telling the truth. And I think there are people. There was a story just recently about a meteorologist in Georgia who had been a steadfast denier of climate science forever and been very vocal about it. And he finally, there's a, there was a news report written about him because he finally came to the conclusion that he was doing what he was complaining everybody else was doing, which is only looking for facts that supported his point of view. And as soon as he took an honest look at it, he completely did a 180, and then he did a, something like a five-part series about climate change. So that's another thing to remember, is that the, the important people will, uh, I think we can get access to enough people to make a difference, and we just have to try. It's a great question. Yes. Yeah, thank you for all the information. I think the vector-borne disease stuff is really important, and a lot of people aren't aware of that, just how big of a problem that it could become under climate change. Um, so I'd like to see more effort from UC San Diego to uh, work on some of these initiatives to reduce maybe our, our transportation carbon footprint. Um, the university says that sustainability is in its DNA, but they also cut the transit subsidy significantly. We used to have a free bus zone that we would use. So we're sort of hearing one message from the university, uh, but their actions are a bit different in terms of they continue to build parking garages on campus. So yeah. I guess I would just encourage folks here to sort of, you know, uh, encourage the university to back up what they're saying with, with more actions, maybe a, a transit subsidy for lower income workers on campus, things like that. Um, so I think we can do better. It's more of a comment than a question. And if, if you can do any pushing on your end too, that'd be great. So thank you. I appreciate your statement. And I, and I have been hearing about the microgrid here, which I've been getting a lot of people to come and visit. And apparently it's quite a model for uh, sustainable and low impact energy for the university. So I think you're right. They could do better, but they've also done some pretty astounding things. And I know they focus a lot on the sustainability of buildings when they do construction here, too. A lot of uh, model buildings. Who else has got a comment, yeah. question? Yes, Ms. Dolores. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm wondering if you um, could put um, um, the, the Paris conference in, in, in context with this. How do you think that um, changes, uh, changes things? She's talking about COP21, uh, COP21 in Paris in December, the meeting of world leaders. I think 190 countries got together and actually came to agreement for the very first time on, unfortunately, non-binding uh, declarations to reduce greenhouse gases. And I'm sure there are a lot of opinions about, about it. I was pleased because it was progress. I think it's nowhere near enough. They're also shooting for a goal of two degrees Celsius as um, what, what we want to aim for, at not letting temperatures get more than two degrees. But we've already seen, when I was talking about the statistics about fire behavior with one degree Celsius, or even a little bit less than one degree Celsius, if you can imagine doubling that, I think about that as a doc, that one degree around what we've had so far is essentially if the Earth was a patient she'd have a temperature of 100.4. She'd have a fever. That's where we define a fever. Two degrees is a temperature of 102 plus. 
and you're really sick at 102 degrees. And I think the Earth acts much more like, in, in terms of the amount of impact for a small change, much more like a person uh, than just the ambient air temperature. So I'm getting a little bit off track, but I think ultimately it's a start. It's a worldwide acknowledgement of the problem. Uh, there are a lot of organizations around the world that are becoming more emboldened and uh, active as a result of the success of the talks. I think the succe success is nowhere near enough to stave off the worst impacts. Uh, but it feels like the last couple of years momentum is changing, and I was pretty sure we were going to get an agreement just because of everything else happening in the world. And it's not insignificant. It's actually really important that cities like San Diego are stepping up and, and going well beyond what Paris did. And now the key is for all of us to get in behind them and say, okay, we're going to hold you to it. We want to see that actually happen. And we're going to make sure that it does. And if you start delaying and putting things off, we're going to be calling you out. So let's move forward. Do we have time for one more? Mariah's nodding her head. Okay. One more. Anybody? How do you feel about uh, nuclear? I'm kind of mixed about it. I have to admit I haven't studied it. I love the fact that, that it's carbon neutral or, or essentially doesn't, um, doesn't create greenhouse gases, but it does cause a lot of warming of waters. Uh, I think it's harmful for sea life, and they haven't solved the problem of what do you do with uh, spent uranium. I think this phrase, all of the above, is needs to be retired. Uh, I'm not sure if nuclear should be in the new mix. I think the capacity of solar, what we were talking about, how much energy there is to be gained from it and how cheap it's gotten to get it, uh, I would like to see us do more with, with less risky sources of energy. But I, don't, I can't say that I'm totally against it. I think we have to see how it evolves over time, too. Apparently, it takes a long time to get a nuclear plant approved and then built. But solar goes up really fast. So that's another big advantage. Sorry, I'm not an expert, but that's my two cents. All right, I know that I've gone over my time. I really want to thank you for being here. It was really great to be able to talk to you and be at UCSD again.